Jovanka Jakubek Lalik, Associate Professor, Faculty of Law and Administration, University of Warsaw. Good evening, delighted to have you with us. Good evening, it's my pleasure. So let me start by asking you about Kayakalas. How happy are with this choice? What do you think about it? And will this translate into gains for uh, Central and Eastern Europe? Mm -hmm. Kaya Kalas, uh, she is the former Estonian prime minister and uh, very well-known politician, especially for her very tough position against Russia. So he, she was from the very beginning of Russian aggression against Ukraine, critical uh, and uh, very supportive towards Ukraine. Uh, and also in the domestic politics, uh, she is known as a also politician who is uh, very strong in relation to uh, any kind of uh, Russian uh, 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 Russian um, uh, exposure uh, of of uh, this kind of um, situation. So, for example, she was also um, uh, removing the Soviet monuments uh, from from Estonia. Uh, so uh, here I think that uh, her strong position, her tough position uh, is also prominent when, when it comes to the position of the European Union uh, towards Ukraine. And also Kaya Kalas being from the Baltic uh, country and also country with a strong Russian uh, minority uh, will for sure be pursuing uh, policies uh, which will be in favor of supporting Ukraine. So here we can expect a uh, strong development of these policies. All right. Before we dive farther into the individuals in question, I would also like to take a step back and look at this uh, reshuffle as a whole. Mm. And we're curious about whether or not the, the new people coming into the top position, as well as some of the familiar faces, is going to change course when it comes to the direction of the European Union? Or do you think it's more of a continuation of the strategy that has already been pursued? I definitely think it's going to be a continuation because uh, we expect that Ursula von der Leyen will still be um, the president of the European Commission. So here for sure uh, she is still uh, supported by the majority of the European Parliament. I think that here the voting is not going to be really challenging. Uh, when it comes to the um, uh, other positions uh, which will be also important in the European, Antonio Costa, uh, the Portuguese ex-Prime Minister, uh, he also so I don't expect that he will provide any drastic, dramatic changes from the uh, previous uh, European Union policies. So here I would rather expect continuation. As we can see, this uh, choice of the three top figures is well balanced uh, in terms of uh, geography. So we have Portugal, Germany and one of the Baltic states. In terms of also political families, so we have a nominee of the EPP, we have the nominee of the Social Democratic Party and also uh, of the Liberal Party. Uh, uh, and also gender uh, is important. So here also we have uh, women who would be probably elected as the high representative for foreign policy. Uh, right. So uh, speaking about the European Parliament parties, uh, former Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki said that law and justice is exploring creating a central Eastern European grouping with other uh, Eastern countries probably with Hungary. Uh, so do you think that this will happen? And what is in general happening on that, on, on that front, right? Because sort of with, with different groupings within the European Parliament, are there any shifts and changes? Well, for sure, uh, there is expressed uh, dissatisfaction by the far right wing parties, uh, which were, uh, let's say, not consulted in their view when it comes to election or, or appointment of the top position in the EU. So here, uh, both Viktor Orban and Georgia Meloni expressed their dissatisfaction and uh, they basically say that uh, because the outcome of the European Parliament election is uh, giving them more uh, powers, more, more, um, more MPs in the MEPs in the European Parliament, which means that also they would uh, expect uh, bigger influence on, um, uh, on the top uh, EU position, but also on the direction of the European Union policies. This is not the case, and this is why they were voting actually against, uh, partially supporting, partially abstaining, partially against when it comes to these uh, three top candidates, as, as we know. Uh, and here also I would expect uh, that uh, they will form a strong opposition towards the, um, uh, the policies. However, we will see. I mean, again, uh, for example, Georgia Meloni, depending on the political situation, can uh, sometimes support uh, some uh, politicians and some uh, policies, and sometimes she will be probably against.
All right, uh, focusing on the same topic, there seems to be a slight divide when it comes to the European Council and the European Parliament as we mm -hmm. see the electorate slightly shift to the right during the last election cycle. Do you think that this might present a problem when it comes to cohesiveness between uh, this interwoven European structure? Or do you think that the political divide that we're seeing that's already emerging might hinder the effectiveness of the Union altogether? Well, for sure, I think that the mainstream political parties of the European Union need to listen to the voters in general. Uh, so uh, when we see that there is some percentage which is increasing in, in recent uh, elections, which are in favor of different policies, we need to ask ourselves the question, why is that so? Yes, and definitely it will for sure impact uh, the political uh, outcome of the decision making of the European Parliament. But also I think that uh, uh, in, uh, recent weeks uh, showed us uh, that, uh, for example, Ursula von der Leyen, she was also uh, consulting with, for example, Georgia Meloni. Yes? So we could see that here also um, there is a debate. Uh, for sure, the leaders are listening to the voters and also uh, think how to um, how to address the concerns which were raised by the outcome of the elections. Uh, right, let me stick to, uh, to Central uh, Europe. Hungary is taking over the presidency of the Council of the European Union. So what, uh, are we expecting any changes? Uh, can they do anything, influence the, the EU in some way that would be, for instance, beneficial to Viktor Orban? Well, for sure, uh, the presidency in the European Union is no longer such an important uh, um, uh, rule maker or agenda setter as it used to be um, uh, in the past. So I don't expect that uh, Hungary will be able to influence to a large extent what will be happening in next uh, weeks and next months. However, having said that, we need to also say that there is uh, some potential, especially in the media exposure, in uh, trying to provide new topics for discussions, new, new issues also to be addressed by the European Union. So here I would expect that Hungary will present a different course to the one that was presented by Belgian presidency and the next presidency, which, we, which, which will be Polish presidency. Right, and just uh, let me uh, follow up on that on Poland, actually, uh, because the European Commission is introducing this excessive deficit procedure against Poland, right? So, uh, so Polish uh, Prime Minister was just talking about this. So what does it entail and will we manage to somehow, um, I don't know, avoid it, address it, whatever can be done? Well, for sure, we need to be in a close dialogue with the European Commission and all the European Union institutions. Um, there is, uh, of course, a challenge when it comes to the planning of the budget of Poland and the debt, which uh, increased in, in recent years. Uh, so uh, we need to, um, as Polish government, Polish government needs to uh, be in, in a position to um, address those, those challenges. And for sure, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be one of the most important important aspects of work of the Polish government. All right, can you give us a little bit of detail of what this uh, excessive deficit procedure and uh, inclusion of Poland means? And uh, of course, like the Polish Prime Minister rightfully is a bit up in arms about it, saying that Poland have been paying a fair share uh, on the contributing to defense. And so maybe the inclusion of being in this uh, procedure doesn't seem fair to him. Can you help us break down a little bit uh, what this entails and what it means for Poland? Well, again, uh, European Union is a political union. So here we would uh, need to understand uh, to what extent uh, this, uh, Euro uh, this economic factors will impact the political position of the country. For sure, there are some objective uh, criteria when it comes to monitoring the budgets and all the European Union member states are obliged to follow those criteria. And uh, the excessive spending on the pre of the previous uh, Polish government uh, led to the more, more uh, challenging situation uh, in Poland. However, I think that uh, there is uh, some truth in, in also looking at the general situation in Poland and also uh, trying to understand to what extent uh, some um, expenses of the government also were necessary in the changed uh, political and geopolitical situation of our country. So here again, I think that being open to the debate and being open to addressing those issues and coming up with a reparation plan that would be very important for the Polish government. So hopefully a solution will be found. Thank you so much for being with us this evening.